Please open up your Bibles to Daniel chapter 2, and it will be a while since we turn over there. As you might recall, we were covering places in China. As we were covering places in China, we see how Buddhism prospered, and how Buddhism prospered was that it combined elements with what they have, Taoism or Taoism. And we already seen how Taoism was born. I think, uh, if I recall from me memory, Lao Tse is the one who founded it. And then Confucianism, or Confucius. So Buddhism made inroads through India. It's because of India that Buddhism was able to prosper, but it combined the elements of the Chinese culture, and that's how it survived and became powerful. Remember, that's the same thing with the Roman Catholic Church. The Roman Catholic Church, how they were able to become powerful was because they combined elements of their culture. Now, you're going to see that especially more and more as we cover today's timeline of their history. We're going to go a little bit back to China later on, but we're going to go backwards now to India. Remember, India was rich. This was where all the heresy, uh, all the false religion was starting. Elements of Hinduism was born, but it wasn't, to my knowledge, called Hinduism that time yet. Basically, the ones that you want to know is Brahmins. Brahmanism. Brahmanism is where you get the chief elite priests in the religious system of what now become, became known as Hinduism. These are the priests, the elitists. And remember, they had their Hindu, early Hindu form of scriptures that time that was forming. And Brahmanism was where it was becoming prosperous. Buddhism was starting to become prosperous in China despite some conflict, but that's normal in cultural conflicts throughout every time period and throughout every historical era. We've also seen how Buddhism came from here and Jainism. So Buddhism is so powerful, that's why it spread like, it's one of the uh, world's largest religions, so to speak, because it was just making inroads throughout all parts of Asia. And remember, Satan was using his false messiahs through Jainism and Buddhism that imitated somewhat like Jesus Christ. And you see the false teachings of Brahmanism where they taught about reincarnation. Now, these guys are pretty wicked people. Now, you might say, why is it? Aren't they supposed to be holy people? Well, at a religion where you reach to a point where people think that it's blasphemy to kill a cow and they starve to death, literally, while letting those cows live off fat, that don't sound right. Brahmanism, they say within their caste system, which matches with their reincarnation cycle. Reincarnation basically goes the idea, as you might recall, that the soul, well, after you die, the soul, it can migrate into a different life after that. Depending on your good deeds or your bad deeds, then you can go higher. So you can become a rich man if you do good deeds now. If you do bad things, then perhaps you'll end up into a criminal. So that's the idea about their good versus bad system. Now, the case system is pretty bad. It's a messed up idea where basically the Brahmins, they were treated as like, I mean, they're not gods, but they were pretty much treated like gods. Special treatment. And they say in the K system, the highest that you can go is actually becoming one of the priests of Brahmanism or even a king or a ruler. So that's the highest areas of the K system if you do well in your life. So... They lived accordingly with a lot of power and with success. Now, remember, India at that time was going through a lot of conflict with Alexander the Great and then his reign that was becoming split apart, but he reached parts of India. So it's a Grecian Indian culture. 
So it's a Grecian Indian culture. By the way, remember, Buddhism is starting to form and become very powerful. So Brahmanism was greatly in danger, but how they were able to do it is the same tactic like the Buddhists did. They try to find areas that can relate to cultural issues of that time that they can relate to. And then they just amend their religion and keep changing the religion, just like the Catholic Church just keeps changing every single time. That's why they're the most powerful religion in the world. You just have to keep changing your mind and go with the flow with how the culture goes. By doing that, Brahmanism became very powerful and successful. And they flourished for years, for years. Remember another thing that I taught you. So that's how Greco-Buddhist architecture and arts were spreading all over throughout India. And then China was infested here. But remember the group of people that I talked about, the Aryans? Do you remember that group? Yes. Remember what I talked about, how the devil used them? Because when Noah gave his decrees to the three sons, the devil was paying attention to all three. So remember through Ham's side, the devil paid attention to that side, where Nimrod and then the Canaanites and the, later on the Philistines can be formed and cause conflict. Through Shem, it's, uh, you notice that the devil was paying attention where Noah decreed, uh, blessed be the Lord God of Shem. So it's all about spiritism. Well, look at the fruits now. So Satan was able to twist that now against through Shem's line. The one for Japheth was that he shall be enlarged and increased. So the devil paid, paid very close attention to that and he said, okay, then I'm going to use Japheth's line here. So through Japheth's line, and remember there was always intermingling going on ever since the BCs. It's inevitable when you give it enough time. So it became an Indo-European form. Combining with Japheth's blessing, quote unquote, which actually became the problem now that the devil used it, he used it as a tool where Japheth would spread throughout, and these Indo-European people were the main one, remember, responsible for these kinds of mess that became eventually born. So remember that the early, very early Hindu teachings was able to become formed because of the Indo-European, the, uh, the Aryans that later came out. The Indo-European people were the ones responsible for spreading. So because it's Indo-European, they spread through here. And then look at your map. It's around here. So guess where they reached all the way up to? Because we're going all the way back to BCs, right? Throughout the time of Noah. Shem, remember, carried his spiritism, which was rampant with shamanism that time. Remember I taught you that a long time ago? So shamanism, through, J, uh, through Shem's quote-unquote blessing that Satan used, utilized, shamanism was an ancient religion in Siberia, which where we know that where Russia is close to, and then Mongolia, and then it hit Korea. Korea was infested with that for over a millennia, shamanism, but it carried on to the Americas, remember. America, through the Native Americans through that heavy spirit religion. So that's how the devil used that, how the devil... So Shem reached all the way over there. How the devil used Japheth's line was, because he was enlarging, he not, reached, he not only reached up to here, but he reached all the way up to here. And they say this, they say that if the priesthood of Brahmanism shared the, shared the same thing from the root of the priesthood of the Indo-European, the priesthood of the Indo-European back then was what turned into Brahmanism and eventually the Druids. See what the devil do it, does? He always looks hundreds of years ahead to produce his plans. The Druids, as you might know a little bit about their history, they are a scary bunch of people. So they are very scary people. Let's review back. Remember at uh, the timeline of Julius Caesar, you've heard me mention briefly that Julius Caesar's empire reached all the way up to Britain. So to hear about the accounts of, of the Druids, you would go to Julius Caesar. Julius Caesar, when he described about the Druids and the Celtic people, 
He mentioned about some of the culture, their worship. I mean, it's complete paganism. A lot of the occult practices that you find today, you can match it up with the Druids. Now, the Druids, they say that their priesthood, guess what? Not much different from the Brahmins. Elite type of people. They had the benefit. The riches, uh, the position that you want to be in is the priesthood. Because according to some historical sources, you, uh, you're free from a lot of taxes and also you don't have to go to war. So because of that, a lot of the younger generations were enticed and they signed up to become Druids. But Druids, uh, to be under their training, goes, can go as long as 20 years. 20 years. So it can go as far as through 20 years. Now, uh, all the sources that I'm giving to you uh, from the top of my head will be found as a review from Widowson's book, as I mentioned before. And the second one would obviously be at Britannica, by uh, Brit uh, Encyclopedia Britannica. So you can look up those sources and you can also Google some of the terms that I mentioned and then clarify and confirm yourself. Uh, returning back to the point at hand, the Celts, these people were extremely powerful. They were feared. They were feared by the people, just like in India. They feared their priests. They feared them because of all the power. Because, I mean, they don't want to disgrace, really, in India, the holy men. Because at the reincarnation cycle, something bad might happen to me. Guess who believes about soul migration? These guys to the Celts, the Druids. They believe that. See, so that's why... It's, there are historical sources I would mention that the Brahmanism, all the way from Indo-European, which the Celts could share. How about that? Now, continuing on about these Druids, the, the wicked thing and the scary thing about these people is, I don't know if you've heard this term, the wicker man, but I don't know where you know about the origin of it. If you heard that term, wicker man, the origin is basically they built up this a huge man, uh, I don't know what they made it out of, straw or wood or etc., but it's a huge doll man, so to speak, like many feet high, but they would put humans inside this doll man, and then for human sacrifice, sometimes some pictures depict as bunch of people crammed inside this huge wicker man, and then they would light up that wicker man, and it would set on fire, and that's how they, sac they did human sacrifices, human sacrifices. As far as Halloween is concerned, Jack Chick, if you read his writings, he would mention about the source of Halloween, for some of you who didn't know, would be, I don't know if I pronounced this right, but it would be Samhain. And Samhain, what they would do is that they would go from house to house seeking human sacrifice. Now, some people would describe as some Satanists where they would like to take uh, young virgins and... The Druids are depicted through Jack Chick's comics as going from house to house, taking young virgins or suitable, whatever hu suitable human sacrifice they can find, and then sacrifice them on their holy day, so to speak, their holy day. These wicked people, if they don't get the human sacrifice, then Jack Chick mentioned that what they would do is that they would draw the symbol. It would perhaps be a pentagram a blood on their door. Now, where did they get the idea of putting blood on the door? And then God Almighty, he was thinking about the lamb being sacrificed. One on this side, one on that side, one on top. Jesus Christ being the sacrifice to save people. But the devil blasphemed it by twisting it the other way as saying, no, what we're going to do is kill people. So then by drawing that pentagram symbol or whatever symbol that they uh, painted on the door with blood, then it would, not, it would declare a curse upon that house and, that, and demons would probably go inside that house or some kind of curse would go inside that house. To be rescued from the demons that night is if they comply to their demands and give them a human sacrifice and then the Druids, they would leave a jack-o'-lantern in front of the door. That's where you get those ideas about Halloween pumpkins in front of doors. It's supposed to be a blessing, so to speak. Guess who picked it up later on? You wouldn't believe it. These guys. Didn't you know that? 
these guys are the ones who, the Catholic Church, and maybe someday I'll explain a little bit more about that, but you can research it on Halloween, but these guys pick this up, and then they have an All Hallows Eve where it's supposed to be some kind of holy day of all things. Holy day of all things. You know what God's sense of humor was? Uh, probably about, yeah, about a thousand years later. You know what God's sense of humor was? One guy named Martin Luther nailed the 99 Thesis in front of the door to disgrace the Catholic Church on Halloween. Boy, did they have a Halloween that time. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, returning back to the main point, these guys were scary people. So these guys were also known as the scholars of their day, just like the Brahmins. So then the Brahmins, they were the ones hailed as the highly educated people, rich people. Wait a minute, then who, who followed along with that? Screaming, screaming, screaming over here. The Catholics, that's how they survived. You want me to tell you how you survive as a church and become powerful? Adapt to the cultural norm and then seek higher education. And then because of that, you will have a respectable, seek respectable positions in society and you'll flourish and you'll become powerful in Satan's kingdom, not God's kingdom. Right. That's of the devil's kingdom. What did Satan offer? I'll give you uh, all the kingdoms of this world if you bow down and worship me. So if you bow down and compromise right. to Satan's well, system, he'll give it to you. Yep. So the Catholics follow along with what the Brahmins did, the Druids did. So because they're highly elitist in knowledge, education, a lot of the systems of their culture that time. It is interesting, that's why some people attribute the Stonehenge to them. Mm -hmm. Now, use your heads now. Remember the Americas? In the Americas, they had these weird pyramid-like structures and remember that the Olmecs civilization, they had these uh, giant stone heads Stone heads, kind of like Stonehenge with uh, what the Druids had. You see these strange stone-like structures, which, is, which baffles a lot of intellectual minds today. And they're wondering how could these ancient people of that timeline create something like that that we can't do today unless we have advanced technology. Remember, there are two things that I taught you that time. One is, it is very possible, because they were from... Uh, the Noahic Flood, they carried on that knowledge from Noah's timeline. And Noah's timeline, remember, a Genesis 6 civilization. I mentioned that as pivotal key constantly. That's what mankind is trying to attain. So they carried on that Genesis, civil Genesis 6 civilization knowledge. And remember, during that time, it was deteriorating. It was deteriorating. That's evident when you look at the book of Genesis chapter 10 and chapter 11. The age was shrinking more and more and more. So people weren't living as long as before. The civilization, uh, the epitome of the Genesis 6 civilization was deteriorating and mankind is trying to reclaim that today. Today. The second possibility is, remember, the Israelites were the ones who drove out. That's what it's worded in your King James Bible. They drove out the Canaanites. The Canaanites, what did they consist of? Remember, the giants. When they consisted of the giants and they driven them out, you got to realize this, and Satan had to be at an area where the, he would not be bothered, especially his remnants. His remnants want to be at a location where they're not bothered anymore. America's was perfect. And remember, that's why I taught you that some of the coins that you see in the Americas matched with the Phoenicia. Canaan is a part of the Phoenician kingdom, remember. They had connections with the Phoenician kingdom. Remember about those lines at Peru that, prob that you can only do it from an aerial view, and it you can achieve that if you do it through a UFO, so to speak. So America has a lot of strange stuff, pyramid-like structures that matches with Egypt. I mean, large, massive stones at the Stonehenge. How do you move this unless they were giants? How can you do that unless there are remnants from the sons of God, those mutants? I mean, think about it. This is way out there. So, I mean, that sounds logical. If you're pushed away from Asia Minor and then push, 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 then you go up to here where you don't get bothered. And then especially at the Americas, 
I mean, this is one of the farthest islands that you will get away from Israel. Mm -hmm. Is right over here. And then America, totally different landmass and continent. So it would make a lot of sense that the reason why the Celts and the Druid culture, they had some advanced stuff is because it's inherited, passed on from the sons of God. That's very possible, especially their occultic satanic practices. Think about that for a while. But these guys, the Celts, they were soon to be overrun. And these are known as the famous group that you're going to hear throughout history, Anglo-Saxons. Anglo-Saxons, how these guys came to be, was through a mixture of Britain and the Germanic tribes. Here we go. Go to Daniel chapter 2. Now, Daniel chapter 2, doctrinally, we can see that it is applied to the tribulation. To the tribulation. However, you can see a partial application going on. A partial application which other scholars would view it as this timeline that we're speaking of. Go to the book of Daniel. Go to the book of Daniel. Welcome to the age of the Goths and Germanic tribes, the Ten Kingdoms. You can notice the names of these Ten Kingdoms. These are the guys that messed up your entire history, actually. These are the guys that messed up your language today. If you study our English language, our English language is a big mess. I took English, I mean, I took English language at Berkeley. I took uh, their classes, studied the traces and roots. That's what I specialized in. And English language today is not really good language. They always make fun of it. English major professors constantly made fun of the English language. But it all came because of the barbarians. The barbarians, which is the Germanic tribes, this whole empire, remember, where, where did Rome reach? Rome's clutches, because it was an iron fist, it reached around everywhere here. It reached all the way up to Britain because of Julius Caesar. So remember, Rome's power is pretty much what you're looking at is all of the Roman Empire. That's what you're pretty much looking at. You're almost looking at the entirety of the Roman Empire. But the Roman Empire, remember, it's falling apart. It's falling apart. The reason why it's falling apart is these Germanic tribes. And there was a mixture of Roman and barbarian culture that civilization, culture, language, and a lot of things were lost. Because it was taking, it was developing into scores of years to centuries before the official power of the Holy Roman Catholic Church Empire took over completely. Look at Daniel chapter 2. So let's look at the partial application here with Rome. Verse 40, and the fourth kingdom shall be strong as iron, for as much as iron breaketh in pieces and subdueth all things, and as iron that breaketh all these shall it break in pieces and bruise. That's Rome. I mean, it conquered Alexander's leftover powers. It conquered Hannibal, who was known as one of the greats. It conquered a lot of other powerful kingdoms. And Rome survived civil wars. I mean, it just bang, 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 bang with an iron fist, and it subdued everything. But now look what happens at verse 41. And whereas thou sawest the feet and toes, part of potter's clay and part of iron, the kingdom shall be what? Divided. Now look at that. That Roman kingdom, it becomes divided because of the potter. I mean, uh, because of the clay, excuse me. But there shall be in it of the strength of the iron, for as much as thou sawest the what? Iron mixed with miry clay. And those things don't mix. It becomes a perversion of life and human society. And that's what they did. Because they were mingling so much. I mean, it, the richness of the civilization and culture was completely lost. Verse 42, And as the toes of the feet were part of iron and part of clay, so that kingdom shall be partly strong and partly broken. And whereas thou sawest iron mixed with miry clay, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men, but they shall not cleave one to another, even as iron is not mixed with clay. 
So notice here that there's a mingling going on of iron Rome with clay, if we can partially apply that to the Germanic tribes. But then again, if we look at the verse and you take it as it says, doctrinally, that doesn't work. That definitely applies to the tribulation because it says here that uh, in, in verse 44, the days of these kings, God's going to set up a kingdom and conquer them. But guess who can claim verse 44? Who conquers these guys? The Roman Catholic Church then. Uh -huh, uh -huh, uh -huh. See that? And that's how the Holy Roman Empire was born, which we're going to look at later on. But obviously that's not the case. Verse 45, God himself has to set up the kingdom. And the Pope is definitely not Jesus Christ himself on earth. Also, verse 43 makes it impossible. They mingle themselves with the seed of men. See, these people, they're not humans. They're something else. Uh, returning to the main point, now we see the Goths. Now, the Goths, they were the thorn on the side of the Romans for centuries. Literally centuries. I mean, long before Constantine, you got to realize these Goths gave so much problems to the Roman Empire and as barbarians, we can say this. You know where they came from? Before the Vikings, these guys came out, the Goths. Before the Vikings came out from southern Scandinavia, it was the Goths who first came out. You thought the Vikings were bad people. You got to look back in your history. The Goths also became a thorn on the side. These people were known for their... Uh, short shields and short swords, uh, rounded shields and short swords. And these people, they just kept giving problem after problem to Rome. Now, what happened is that it just went back and forth. They would uh, sack Rome, just kind of like a Viking mentality where they would just sack, do raids. And then sometimes the Roman Empire would make deals with the Goths to defend them or to recruit them as soldiers. And what that did was it became a huge problem because it became a huge problem now where Roman civilization is becoming corrupted and messed up through these quote-unquote barbarians, through these barbarians. The Goths, eventually, they split into two groups, and these two groups are known East versus West. These became known as the Ostrogoths and the Visigoths. The Visigoths, uh, I, I'm not, yeah, I have my map here, so, yep, I'm right. The Visigoths, they reached all the way up to here at the uh, west side. The Ostrogoths, they reached all the way up to here on the Roman area side. Uh, what I mean by Roman M area i know i realize that's the whole empire i meant near rome so it's more near italy and rome that's what i meant to say so they were in these areas now they could have went further uh, they could have went further east but i'll talk about the eastern empire a little later so they split into east and west let me describe the germanic tribes of this time This is on page 157 of Man and His History, and this is a university textbook. It reads the following. Other Germanic tribes now began to break into the empire. They knew that the Western emperor could do little to stop them. And furthermore, they were being pushed west by the Huns who were advancing into Central Europe. In the early 5th century, the Vandals crossed the Rhine and swept across Gaul into Spain. <clears throat> Another tribe, the Suevi, settled in northwestern Spain, the Franks settled in northern Gaul, the Burgundians in southeastern Gaul, the Visigoths, after sacking Rome, left Italy and drove the Vandals from Spain into Africa. Then the Visigoths settled down in southwestern Gaul and in Spain, while the Vandals proceeded to conquer North Africa. Now notice that Daniel mentions about ten toes of these barbaric tribes. You see a lot of these names that matched with some of these tribes that I mentioned to you. They were spreading all over. Rome, it was the end. Rome hit its end. But guess who survived? The Christian church. So what did Rome have to do? That's why they had to mingle with them. They had to adapt to the culture of their time. 
to survive. But they mingled with the pagans, the barbaric tribes. So guess what? There was a mingling of paganism and Christianity and the Roman culture. Oh, so the Roman Catholic Church system is just a hot mess. Yes, you got it right. It is not scriptural. It is totally anti-scriptural. It's no different from Buddhism and Brahmanism, period. No different. No different. Just adapting to the culture of its time. Within 30 years of the sack of Rome, Germanic barbarians had taken over at least half of the Western Empire. The native Romans did very little to stop them. Why? Why? I mean, Roman Empire was falling apart. To most Romans of the Western Empire, it made little difference whether they were ruled by the barbarians or by the emperor's agents. See, these emperors, they were brutal dictators persecuting Christians, but it's not just Christians seeing them as brutal people. Now the common people are seeing that. So the Lord was sending judgment. Pagan Rome is falling apart and gone. Let's keep reading. Western prosperity had been severely damaged by the civil wars and invasions of the 3rd century and it had never returned. Taxes were very heavy and the oppressive hand of officials was felt everywhere. What did the Romans stand to lose by being ruled by barbarians? Had the Germans been a fierce wild people bent on destroying civilization, the case might have been different. But the Germans were relatively tame and many Romans actually welcomed them in the hope of being relieved of taxes and officials. This, the reason why is because the German barbarians, it says on page 159, the Germanic barbarians did not think of themselves as breaking up the Roman Empire. They merely considered that they had settled within the empire and were ruling in the emperor's name. The Western emperors, having no choice in the matter, recognized the barbarians as their allies and granted them, granted them authority to rule in the emperor's name. This made the barbarians feel important and it kept alive the idea that the empire was still united. So that's why Brother Max coming from that region, he would feel very important and we keep him in here because we fool him into giving him a position. So that's the idea why they were able to settle down and we don't have to feel threatened by Max Hyde. He's not gonna kill us. He'll be okay. He'll be okay, church. So, <laughs> uh, returning to the point at hand, we see that this is how the Germanic tribes, especially the Goths, were the ones that just literally changed the entire Roman civilization. And it changed over here too with the Anglo-Saxons. And they're an important group because eventually England, which is a very important focal point of history, where our King James Bible eventually came from, we're going to have to pay attention to these guys later on, the Anglo-Saxons. Okay. We'll come to them later. But remember this, this whole culture, including this area, is infested with a mixture of Roman culture, and it is infested with paganism and Christianity who's spreading abroad here. So these are the three mingling. The perfect religion that fits is Catholic. It just makes so much sense. It fits like a glove. It fits beautifully with that. The Anglo-Saxons, on the other hand, the one Germanic people at page 160, who entered the Roman Empire as destroyers were the Anglo-Saxons. They were a wild pagan people untouched by Roman civilization. They began settling in Britain around 450, they did not ask to be Roman allies, nor did they claim to rule in the emperor's name. They met fierce resistance from the Roman Britons. After 150 years of fighting, the Anglo-Saxons had occupied a considerable part of Britain, but the Britons still managed to hold the western parts of the island. So the Anglo-Saxons were a very uh, unique bunch of the barbaric tribes. And they were supposed to be over here, which is far different, or at least there's a significant amount of difference from the remaining tribes that mingled with Roman civilization here. Now we come to, then what's going on with Rome? How did Iron Rome fall apart? So let's read a little bit. During the persecution of Christians, the one who is responsible, or perhaps responsible for the worst persecution of Christians was Diocletian. So the Lord paid special attention to that guy. 
That guy, Diocletian, was a run responsible where Rome lost its unified form, so to speak. He was the one, for some of you that don't know, remember, Roman Empire is much larger than this. It's controlling Israel. Where is Israel? It's split into east and west. East and west. The Eastern Roman Empire was differentiated from the Western Roman Empire. Now, it went back and forth with divisions and unification, division and unification, but the one who pretty much started things, where it can start out with two divisions, would be Diocletian. He would be one of those people. It says here, for the protect, uh, page 146, for the protection of the frontiers, Diocletian set up a double emperorship with one emperor himself guarding the eastern frontiers and the other Maximian, the western. Theoretically, the two emperors were co-rulers over a united empire. But the tendency of the double emperorship, which lasted till 476, was to split the empire into two halves, an eastern empire and a western empire. To solve the old problem of succession, Diocletian decreed that the two emperors should abdicate after 20 years and be succeeded by two capable assistants whom they had previously adopted. That doesn't really help, <laughs> as you might know later on. So then, how did Constantine become great? I've told you a little bit about him. Now let me tell you more. After Diocletian's abdication in 305, his plan of succession broke down. Roman armies resumed their old habit of proclaiming their favorite general as emperor. In 311, the general Licinius gained control of the Eastern Empire. The struggle for the Western Empire, meanwhile, narrowed, narrowed to two contenders, Maximus and Constantine. So Constantine was like the subpart of a subpart. But this is how the devil brilliantly used him through his power where it saved the Catholic Church pretty much and they came to be later on in history. Let me keep reading. <laughs> on the eve of battle with his rival, Constantine dreamed that he saw a cross in the sky under which were the words, in this sign conquer. Knowing that the cross was a Christian symbol, Constantine had it inscribed on his standard. At the battle of the Milvian Bridge near Rome, Constantine defeated Maximus and became Western Emperor. Convinced that he owed his victory to the God of the Christians, Constantine ended the great persecution. That's why the Christians were finally relieved of their persecution. But that's a trick. You know why? When the Catholic Church was forming through Constantine, they were already hounding some people to excommunicate and eventually persecute because they disagreed with their doctrines that Constantine helped set up the Catholic. Hey, just uh, like I repeated before and I'll repeat it again, just because you get one specific party that you want to win so badly that there were riots forming all of a sudden today, just because you get that to win all of a sudden doesn't mean, hey, your problem's over. What? What? The devil can use either party either way. Uh -huh. How about that? Oh, the Christians' persecution is finally over. No, a new one is starting to form, and a more dangerous one. Yeah. A more dangerous one. How about that? All right, but getting back to the point at hand, Constantine and Licinius, remember the eastern side, the Roman Empire, now Constantine's building his power, became embroiled in war with one another in 323. Constantine was victorious and became sole emperor. He moved his capital to Byzantium, on the Bosphorus, the eastern channel of the Black Sea Straits, at Byzantium, constantly built, Constantine built an entirely new city, which he called New Rome, but which came to be called Constantinople, city of Constantine. From that time on, the old city of Rome, some of you don't know this, the old city of Rome declined into a provincial city while Constantinople became the greatest city in the Christian world. Some of you didn't know that. You thought that Holy Rome was the greatest uh, city that time. No, it was, it was the mess. It was at the bottom. The only way it became the greatest city in the world was the Catholic Church came into power. The monster reared its ugly head. So then, these barbaric tribes, why didn't they give much trouble to the Eastern Roman Empire? Because it says here on page 158, 
The situation in the Eastern Empire was somewhat different. In the East were many strong, flourishing cities. Agriculture, industry, and commerce were well developed and on a sound footing. The East had taken the shock of the civil wars and invasions of the third century very much as it had taken disasters for thousands of years. It recovered and grew wealthy again. Eastern wealth enabled the emperors to maintain strong armies against both Germanic barbarians and the Persians. It also enabled them to offer generous bribes to Germans and Persians to cease their attacks or to carry, carry them elsewhere. If the Eastern Romans had more spirit of resistance than the Westerners had, it was undoubtedly because they felt they had far more to lose. So the Eastern Empire was much more successful. During that time, it was a very successful Roman Empire. West, falling apart. It was falling apart. The Lord showed Rome. The Lord showed the capital, Rome. This is what you do when you mess with my people. They messed with both of God's people, his early Christian church and the Jews. The Lord taught them something. They became no more until Satan conjured up a different plan for Rome. But we'll look at that centuries ahead. This is where you get the famous Greek Orthodox Christian, uh, quote-unquote, Christian church, which is supposedly the second largest religion of Christianity next to Catholicism. Those two splits are the birth of Rome. Iron, iron, man, iron building up. And that's how the devil used it, to produce the two largest religions of Christianity that, sent, that damned millions, if not billions, of souls to hell. The Orthodox Church as well as Catholicism. Orthodox from the uh, East and then the Roman Catholic Church from the West. Now, the climax. <laughs> so it split to East and West. But East was being invaded by a tribe, which was very powerful. We go all the way back to China. China, remember they built their Great Wall? Mm -hmm. Did you know one of the reasons why? A powerful people that they called the Xiongnu, uh, Xiongnu. The Xiongnu were possibly a form of people from this group. Huns. Mm. That's why they built that Great Wall of China. The Huns during that time, uh, that time, if their earlier remnants were called Xiongnu, the Xiongnu, that time, they were known as humongous amount of horsemen. As a matter of fact, if you look at Revelation chapter 9, it gives a number of people from the east. Mm -hmm. And a lot of uh, prophecy scholars dub that to be China for the tribulation. But if you apply that for a partial apocalyptic event, that would fit well with this bunch. That's why Dr. Ruckman mentioned a possibility about Genghis Khan coming out from the dead. Mm -hmm. But uh, Genghis Khan, who came from the tribes at the Mongolian region, that's where the Huns were from. They were from that Central Asia and where the Mongolia uh, tribes later came out of. Mm -hmm. These guys were not people to mess with. They had as much as 300,000 horsemen just doing archery. 300,000. And that's just a specific group of horsemen who are archers. And those archers, they were very dangerous. They were accurate. They were dangerously accurate. They were very skilled. These, they were speedy people. They were known for speedy attacks. That's why they became the terror of the world that time. It was the time of the Huns. The Huns were the ones that the other barbaric, barbarian tribes were being driven out, even the Goths. The Huns were a powerful group of people. Eventually, because China has a rich history of so many dynasties and civilization and culture and the Great Wall and everything, they were eventually able to make the Xiongnu non-existent later on in time. But because they're being pushed over here, as time passed by, where could they go now? And these guys were called the Huns. So one guy who was really responsible for spreading the scourge was this guy. Attila, the famous Attila the Hun. Attila the Hun, during that time, because they're spreading this way, 
which empire they're going to hit, the Roman Empire. So they're going to hit the, hit the Eastern Roman Empire. So the Eastern Roman Empire, because it's rich and powerful, uh, the way that they survived was through paying their taxes. But one time they didn't. So then through the Huns, especially through the power of Attila, they were able to conquer it back. So they were able to conquer the Eastern Roman Empire. Now they're paying attention to the West. The Goths, they were moved by bribes from the Eastern Roman Empire. Huns, no, nah, it didn't work for them. The Huns, they're going to take it all. They were traveling as far as up to here. They, they were literally reaching the end, man. They're like literally reaching the end. So these guys were like a terror. Attila, his name meant the scourge of God. Wow. Scourge of God. It really matches well with Revelation chapter 9 about these horsemen, the numbers, and being such a scourge, wiping out so many people, etc. Because of their horsemanship and their archery skills, they were like conquering barbaric tribes, parts of the Roman Empire. They were a scary group of people. Attila the Hun, uh, it is said that he killed his brother over something. And he was known as to be, just like Ale the famous Alexander the Great and all the other famous generals, he was definitely a person that was able to spread the empire through warfare, having a general-like mentality. A general-like mentality. So his mentality was where his lieutenants were eating silver dishes, he, on the other hand, was eating out of a wooden dish, and he wouldn't eat delicates. He only ate meat. He only ate meat. This guy, he was known to be short stature, but this guy was uh, powerful, and he was ruthless, and he would go all the way, hardcore. He was definitely a military commander that they can look up to. Attila the Hun, he basically uh, got from the emperor's sister an engagement ring where the emperor's sister asked Attila the Hun to save her from a forced marriage arrangement. Attila the Hun took it the wrong way and he uh, pronounced that she's going to be my wife. Let me get my dowry now. So then he claimed that this whole kingdom should go to him. So then that bam, 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 all because of that total misunderstanding of a one-sided love, or maybe he didn't care about love, he just wanted power or find some excuse. So then what happened was one of the Gothic tribes had to join forces with the, Roman, the Western Roman Empire. Through that combination, the only battle Attila the Hun ever lost, he never lost the battle, the only battle he lost was that combination of the, one of the Gothic tribes and the Western Roman Empire. That's the only way he was driven out. So he was driven out from Gaul. And because he was driven out of Gaul, where would he go? Oh, here goes Catholic Italy, and bam, 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 bam. He was spreading terror and raids. But because of disease and uh, I think uh, it was a famine and then weather, uh, conditions of that time, environmental conditions prevented him from a complete conquest. So then these Catholics, these holy ro ro people, they think that, oh, God saved our lives, and they point a picture of one of these Catholic rulers, you know, driving away with the angel of the Lord, Attila the Hun, and his powerful forces. <laughs> wow. That's kind of funny. I mean, they were about to get their, uh, they were about to wet their pants. And they were saying, oh, look what we did. <laughs> See, our religion is, is good. We know we're on the right side now. So then Attila the Hun, because he was driven out, now what happened was is that he suddenly died as well. And what is interesting is the same thing like Alexander the Great, where he, he was out partying with his soldiers, and then he just suddenly died. Uh, some people thought that it may have been a plot or an assassination attempt. Whatever the case may be, when they buried his body, they want because they, because they respected their commander, and he was such a powerful person and a scary person, and they wanted to protect his body, the people who dug up his burial site, they killed the people who dug up his grave just so that no one will ever know where his body was buried. So after killing them off, then it was in a split with his remaining people and then just became no more after that. So that's where the Huns became wiped out of history. But that was their power during that time. So notice that during this climate, that everyone was grabbing leftover kingdoms from Satan. 
See, that's Satan's trick. I'm going to give you all the kingdoms of this world if you bow down and worship me. And look what happens. Everyone does something with the devil, and they're all fighting for the pieces and leftovers, and Satan is laughing his head off. Now, during this time of this chaos, Satan spread his religions, his paganism, and a culture that was totally in chaos. What will the bloody Christian church do? The Christians, they were just doing what they always did. Not going by the signs of the right. times and panicking about the political climate. You know what they were focusing on? How many souls can I win to Jesus Christ? Right. And let's plant some Bible-believing churches. You know where these guys were spreading? Check this out now. We know that they were spread throughout Europe, but as far as to where? Before the Catholic Church. We'll cover that history next time. It's, it's, it's going to make you excited. But Satan, he sees that pattern. So then he had to do something. We're also going to pay attention to this group. What did they do? Remember, how was this monster formed? Through the power of Alexandria, education, and the church fathers. And then now that they have a secular ruler, Constantine, backing them up, let's see how they try to stomp out Christianity. Remember what I taught you. There were Baptists all the way from the beginning, early centuries, but they're just not called Baptists. I gave you the clear distinctive of what made them different from the Catholic Church. Next time, all right, let's, let's see what happens. God, my Father, I pray tonight's teachings were a blessing to the hearers, made us more aware of our history and how you move, how the devil moves, and how you are able to combat the devil system through just preaching of the word. I pray that we'll see that in our next lessons. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.